everybody. I'm going to read from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8 says, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching. For they are graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. This morning, I have the privilege of transferring the truth of that proverb not only to myself, but also to our church. My dad is our guest speaker this morning. So that's a great privilege and treasure for me, my dad, and my mom is here as well, though I think she's in the back there somewhere. But uh, I'm so honored to introduce him to you uh, because that proverb has proven true in my life. Uh, I grew up in a home, as I know some of you did, not all of you, but some of you grew up in a home where Christian teaching and Christian example was the norm. To receive godly instruction was the norm in our home. And as I know, many of you would say that was a a true proverb in my experience, that this teaching was a, a garland. It was a crown for my head. It was a treasure to wear prominently and boldly and gratefully. Uh, my dad is a wise man. Uh, he is not a particularly wise guy. He's actually the guy that laughs at the wise guys, but he is a wise man. My brothers are wise guys. My dad is a wise man, and uh, he is wise uh, in the scriptures. He is wise in the matters of the heart. My dad is a surgeon of the soul. He is a man who is dedicated to understanding his own heart and the ways in which it does and does not honor God, and he transferred that to his children and to the multitude of disciples that have learned from him and have seen him as a father in the faith. If you could highlight the number of men over the decades that have seen my dad as a father in the faith, they would be legion, and they are men now leading their own tribes, leading their own families, leading in their various spheres of ministry. Uh, but many of them would point back to some wise instruction they received from my dad. And I was happy to share him with them over the years uh, because of the wisdom that he has. He is a humble man. He doesn't take himself seriously at all. Uh, and yet he takes the word of God very seriously. Uh, he is a loving husband. He is a gifted grandfather. Uh, as my children were attest, there's many loving grandfathers. My dad is a gifted grandfather. He finds ways to be a grandfather in ways that are unique and special to each of my children. And I want to, on behalf of Aaron and myself, just extend a welcome to you, mom and dad, and tell you how excited we are to hear from you. And I know the church is excited to hear from you as well. So if you could welcome dad as he comes to preach to us from Ephesians. Good morning. It's great to be here. Thank you for that. I don't know who he was talking about, but he's got me confused with somebody else. But we'll straighten that out in just a second here. I am the band director that was spoken of last week. And today you're going to learn about uh, my, my most important role, which was as a third base coach on John's T-ball team when he was five years old. So we'll talk about that in a minute. I want to bring you greetings from Grace Church up in Frisco, uh, thanks for being here. Thank you. We hear regularly from friends that are here about the amazing things that God is doing in this church, in the life of this church. And we just celebrated the opening of our new building. So it's a great time of celebration up there in Frisco. God has been exceptionally kind to us. We, in our recent pastors meetings, are just pinching ourselves over and over again. What in the world are we doing in this building, which is right behind City Hall, right in the middle of the city? And uh, people look at the building, and it looks beautiful, and then they come in and meet us, and they realize we're still very much a work in progress. So that's good as well. But thank you for inviting me to be here this morning. It's going to be uh, my great privilege to be here. I want to tell you, as I mentioned a minute ago, about a time in John's life. He was five years old. This was his very first experience with organized baseball or t-ball. How many of you know what t-ball is? Okay, most of you. you. We don't have a pitcher. We have a little stand that the ball sits stationary on, and any five-year-old should be able to hit the ball off the tee. However, 
that was my thought as I went into coaching. I was the assistant coach. One of my good friends was the uh, head coach. His son was a six-year-old. And so this was a five- and six-year-old team. And the six-year-olds, were, of course, were the ones with the experience, most of them. We came to the first practice, and I quickly realized that all the kids could run. Some of them ran, actually, times that you didn't want them to be running. Uh, some of the kids could throw, and some of them even in a direction that they intended. A few of them, very few, could catch, very few, could catch the ball. And only one or two were able to hit the ball off the tee with the enough momentum to actually get it past the pitcher. So some of the other coaches in the league determined that uh, the way to win, because it's all about winning in the five- and six-year-old league, the way to win was to have one player who could catch, put him at first base, and one player who could field, put him at pitcher, because the other team's not going to get it past the pitcher's mound anyway, and it's just a formula for success. Hit to the pitcher, throw to first base, you're out. So we generally had three up, three down every inning in our first couple of games, and then we just watched. There was this mercy rule that the team could only allow every person on the team to hit once per inning. So they would just run around the bases, and we played in our first game, we played this other team that had – um, you know, these six-year-olds that were the size of West Prater when they were six years old, they had all been uh, eating, living, breathing baseball since they were, you know, two. So they could all catch. They could all throw. They could, no. They, they, but their coach was smart enough in the five- and six-year-old league that he had a kid that could throw at pitcher's mound and a kid that could catch at first base. And as the ball went to the pitcher after all of our kids batted, if they were able to hit the ball with the tee, they just got out and they killed us because their guys knew how to hit the ball. A few of them passed the pitcher's mound and we didn't have anybody that could field, catch or throw. So we were in serious trouble. So I think the score of that game was something like after three innings, I, I think it was like 30 to nothing or something. We were annihilated by that. And I just remember, man, we've got a lot of work to do on this particular team. The end of the story, though, was a cool end because at the last game of the season that year, we played that same team again. And because of the work that had been done by our very wise coach, he had recognized we got to teach these kids to, to throw. We've got to teach them to bat. We've got to teach them to hit it past the pitcher's mound. We've got to teach them to run the bases. We've got to teach them all these skills. Every one of these kids needs to learn. And he had encouraged the parents to go home and work with the kids at home. I looked at that team the first day and I thought, there, we will never resemble a baseball team. The complexity of this game is just completely beyond. The last game of the season against that same team that beat us 30 to nothing, we turned a double play, shortstop to second base to first, and we beat that team at the end. The problem was their coach had figured out a formula that worked at the beginning of the year when our kids weren't any good and they just kept trying to use that and the rest of their kids never got any better. All of our kids got better and so by the end, we were able to beat that team. We actually looked like a baseball team. That was the end of my coaching career because I just about lost my mind. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. We're going to read from Ephesians 4 this morning. Let's see what that has to do with baseball. Um, Ephesians 4, we're going to read 11 through 16. We're just going to be looking at one verse today, but I want to read the context a little bit. You, you heard about this last week as well. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to three things here, unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that verse 14, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Well, uh, P.T. O'Brien writes this, and then I, I want to take a phrase from his commentary. Peter O'Brien writes the threefold description in verse 13. So that's three things. The unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. This is what he's pointing us to. He's pointing to us to what a victorious church looks like. 
just like that coach on the first day had in his mind as he's looking at this motley collection of five and six year olds, a winning season, winning the game. I'm looking at them thinking, this is a mess and it's not going to get any better. He had faith. So here's what, here's what Paul, the apostle, this great coach who's serving the greatest coach is saying, unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of God, mature manhood, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's what we're looking for. That's our goal. And uh, Peter O'Brien writes this, the threefold description in verse 13 to the ultimate destination of God's people on the last day. Now, through a negative contrast in verse 14, Paul sets forth the more immediate objective that's in line with this final goal and which should take place in the lives of the readers in their current situation. Here's, here's what I think the point of this whole passage is, and I just stole this from O'Brien because I couldn't have said it any better than this. The exalted Christ has given his gifts to the church so that immaturity and instability will increasingly be left behind. That's what we're talking about. Just think about the T-ball team. The exalted Christ to the church has given his gifts to the church so that immaturity and instability will increasingly be left behind and we'll be able to turn a double play by the end of the season. So let's pray and ask the Lord to help us as we look at this uh, verse 14. Father, thank you that you, the generous king that we've sung about this morning, that we heard about last week, have given gifts to all your people. And in particular, you've given gifts to your church, these ministry gifts that you've given, these messengers that you've sent to the church. To build your church up, it is not your plan that your church remain immature, that we as individuals in the church remain immature, that, but that all of us come to fulfill these purposes for which you created us, what you called us to. You've said that through the church, Lord, the manifold wisdom of God will be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, Lord. How much more does that manifest wisdom of God need to be made known in our neighborhoods, in our families, to everyone that we meet through your church? It's amazing. Lord, we we stand amazed that you who are so good and so perfect long to include us and have given us gifts toward that end. So help us, Lord, to hear your word. Help me to speak faithfully. Lord, we ask that your word would penetrate hearts this morning, every one of us that we would respond to you who are the great and generous king, the one who alone can lead us home. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 14, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. I'm gonna drop this pen on the floor, so I'm gonna throw it to you right now. There we go. Thank you. See? He couldn't have done that when he was five years old. Okay, there's no explicit command in this verse. It's a verse revealing a part of God's expected result, what he anticipates seeing as a result of the ascended Jesus sending gifts to the church. This is not a command. This is a description so that something happens. So with that in mind, I want to make basically five observations about this. So uh, we'll be done by about two o'clock this afternoon. So it's one verse with five points. And when you get older, you're allowed to do more than three. I think that's what I heard, learned somewhere along the way. So the first one is this. So that is language of cause and effect. This is cause and effect. It relates back to what Jesus has done for the church, giving ministry gifts to men and women in the church for a specific purpose. So if, if you think about the idea of cause and effect on this baseball team that I've been talking about, baseball player number one hits the ball past the pitcher so that the third base coach, that's me, who's losing his mind because he's thinking this little five-year-old who somehow made it to third base, we're not sure how, how it happened. It was a throwing error, a rare throwing error by the other team, but he's around on third base. There's two outs, and we might score our first run of the game here. So the third, here he is. We want the batter to hit the ball past the pitcher so that this kid on third base will be able to run to home. And I'm telling him run to home, and he starts running toward home. No, 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 home plate. 
So he's doing this detour out and around, and he's coming toward home, and he gets all the way down there. The batter hit it. The cause and effect is happening. The ball gets past the pitcher. He's going to score. It's going to be 30 to 1, and then we realize he doesn't know to touch the plate. So I'm yelling at him, no, touch the home plate. Before the catch. Oh, too late. The catcher had the ball, tagged him out, and it was still 30 to nothing. Okay, so we, but we, what we had there was something we wanted it to happen so that do this so that this. So Jesus has given gifts to the church so that something's going to happen. There's a cause and effect. And that's point one. That wasn't too long. Point number two, the second observation about this, this particular phrase in verse 14. We, so that we. We in the Greek means we. It's we. It's us all together. We must all together grow up into him. It's not something we do individually. It's a we. It's a joint venture. Paul seeks to assure that we see this as a corporate vision, not simply a collection of individual baseball players, each each able to do their thing, but we've got to come together and work as a team. If we're going to turn that double play, the shortstop needs to know that the second baseman is going to be at second base when he throws the ball, because we saw plenty of times when the shortstop had his job right, but the second baseman forgot, and he was not there, and so the ball went out into right field, and then all of the kids scored that way. So we need to assure that everybody knows his job. It's not simply a collection of individual growth plans. However, corporate growth requires individual growth as well. If a child's feet were to grow while his hands remain small, we would look at that and say, something's wrong here. Something's wrong in the development of this child. Or in that t-ball analogy, if one kid can play and he just keeps getting better and better, but nobody else can hit, he gets to first, The next player gets out while he goes to second. The next player gets out when he goes to third. And then he tries to score, but the third player's out, and you're done. And you're never going to score. Everybody has to grow in order that we can all grow together. Again, Peter O'Brien writes this. The contrast between the mature person of verse 13, those three things, the mature man to mature manhood, that's the image that he's holding. And hey, hey, kids, this is what a double play looks like. This is what maturity looks like in the five- and six-year-old t-ball league. I mean, it's pretty astounding when five- and six-year-olds can turn a, a double play. Not only do the latter's ignorance and instability stand over against the knowledge of mature adult, but also the use of the word plural, the plural word children, with its implications of individualism, stands in contrast to the one mature person who's a corporate entity. So again, if one player can always hit the ball, but the other three can't, as a team, we're not going to grow. So there's this balance. It's a corporate thing that also involves each person growing together. John Stott, the English pastor, writes this, although it seems that this growth into maturity is a corporate concept, which it is, describing the church as a whole, yet it clearly depends on the maturing of its individual members. In other words, the growth of every single individual in this church matters to the maturing body. We all grow together. Very critical. This is a church-wide endeavor. This is a church-wide necessity. We grow as a community. There's no spiritual child who's to be left behind. We're to bring everyone along as we move toward the goal that God has for us. Each one, everyone in this church has a role to play. Every person. He gave gifts to the church, as you heard last week. Today, we're going to talk more about how he gave specific gifts of leadership and equipping Again, and and what the purpose of that is, was so that these things would happen. As you will see in subsequent weeks, even the smallest children have a role to play. The smallest children in this church have a role to play in the maturing of the body. How does this change the manner in which you view your community group as you go? Think about that. They need me, and guess what else? I need them. We need to go. And we need to share these gifts and be faithful stewards. Why? Because the glory of God is at stake. He has intended, we don't understand why he did this, but he intended that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God would be made known. And that means he had to give gifts so that we wouldn't stay immature. We wouldn't stay this random collection of five and six-year-olds running all over the field with no idea of what we're doing here. All right? How does this change the way that you think about your family? As you wake up, as you're studying the word together, as dads are leading, as moms are caring for their children, as children are responding to their parents, it's all about the glory of God. It's not about convenience. 
How does it change uh, your sense of responsibility for your brothers and sisters in this church? We're going to talk about that more in a little bit. But we're all responsible. We are, in fact, our brother's keepers because we all need to grow. We, this is a corporate thing. Just as an aside, I was, as I was praying uh, yesterday, I, I just want to mention to you, you're going to hit this verse is really the rest of the book is kind of fleshing this out. The rest of this letter is sh- Paul's showing how this works, how this movement from maturity, from immaturity to maturity works. But children, we don't get our children to obey us. As we're going to read in Ephesians 6, get to the end, children obey children on it. We don't get them to obey us because it makes our life easier, even though it does. We don't get them to obey us so that grandma and grandpa say, your kids are better than your, their cousins, you know, you just have better kids. And so I think you must be doing something right. And we get the, the attaboy about that. We, our kids must obey because the glory of God is in view. This is how we imitate God. And the church is seen for what it's supposed to be seen for, this glorious ship that's headed for this destination. So that's the end of the second observation. The third observation is this. We all begin our spiritual lives as children. So when he's using this language, we will no longer be children, or the word is actually childish. It's an adjective being used as a noun here. We all need to grow. No one starts at mature. No one comes to the kingdom as a mature spiritual being. We all come as children. So the phrase, we will no longer be children, carries with it the implication that we were, or in many cases, like mine, still are children. Change and growth is an expected and anticipated outcome of the ministry that began with Jesus, was passed to the 12, and has come down to us through the word and really through the example of those who held fast to the word and through their lives have given us an example of what maturity looks like in the flesh from generation to generation. That's happened. Notice that he doesn't just look ahead to maturity. It's interesting. He's got these two passages where he talks about, here's what the mature man looks like, those three things we talked about. And then in a minute, he's going to talk about what that looks like as we all grow up together into the head. But right now, he takes us back to the beginning. He doesn't want us to forget that we were children. So Jesus says things like this, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. We all come to the kingdom as children. We don't get to leapfrog over being children. So we are not to any longer remain children, but we all started there. So that's the third observation, sandwiched between these two sections on maturity, these two just glorious statements of where our team is going, guys, five and six-year-olds who don't even know what you're talking about on this is this reminder. I know this guy that was my buddy, he knew where these kids were. He had watched his son the year before who couldn't do baseball, just like I was watching John not be able to do baseball that particular year. Okay. So can you play baseball now? Yeah. Okay. He was actually a pretty good baseball player. Okay. It's universally true in Christianity. No one comes to the church. No one comes to the Lord as a full grown mature person. Sometimes they look mature in the world and we can be fooled into thinking that they're mature, but they're just a a big kid in the world's eyes in a little spiritual body. It's just the way it is. Listen again to what P.T. O'Brien says. The exalted Christ has given his gifts to the church so that immaturity and instability will increasingly be left behind. It's one of my greatest concerns for the church as I uh, have pastored in a number of churches now and I'm just watching, watching over many years, is, is this point or what, what comes from this point? Nobody wants to grow. Everybody wants to think they've arrived and we forget that there's a maturing process that is essential. We have to move from being spiritual children And we want to see this development occurring over time to where we are in God's eyes, spiritually mature, but the growth has to occur. And I find myself and I find many people that I counsel and I find many people in our churches that when it actually comes to them, no, you need to learn how to throw the ball. It's not that you get to see the other people on the team that need to learn how to throw the ball. You need to learn to throw the ball. That's where I can become resistant. I want at that moment, I believe I didn't come as a child. I'm good. We all have work to do to grow. There's a glorious future out there as we grow together. So we all need to grow. We started as children is the third observation. 
Fourth observation, we cannot remain children. So we, we, we all together come together. We remember that we were children. We started as children, but now we cannot remain children or we cannot remain childish. This is a potentially confusing thought if you think back through a biblical perspective on children. Now, my son, John, who is, I think he's one of my favorite preachers. He's a way better preacher than me, but I, and I love to listen to him preach. And he often accuses me of, of biblical ADHD. And I'm going to intentionally do that right now. I'm going to share some other scriptures. I love the Bible. And I get carried away sometimes. But I have these written down, John, so that I won't just go off on a tangent here. But listen, you all know these verses. But just to think through this, this is the same word that Paul's using here, that we can no longer be childish. It's the same word. Matthew 11. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Lord, Father of heaven and earth, that, Lord, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding in the eyes of the world and revealed them to little children. What's he saying there? This is where you have to start. It's the same word, Matthew 21. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies you have, uh, you have prepared praise? So he's recognizing there's a place on the boat, on this ship that's headed for heaven's shore for these little ones. As a matter of fact, there's the only way you're going to get on the boat. So there's something positive about being a child. And so why would Paul kind of denigrate that at this point. We move forward into Romans. Paul is making a case basically against people who are self-righteous in chapter two of Romans. And he's saying, look, you think you're an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, same word, having in the law, the embodiment of knowledge and truth. So he's now starting to say, children are immature. You, you're, you think you're somebody that needs to speak to the children. So we're starting to see a turn as we look at this word. In 1 Corinthians, I, brothers, Paul says, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. So now there's a negative connotation to this word. It's not just be like a child, stay like a child, stay in never, never land, be with Peter Pan, which has been my nickname for most of my life, as you can understand why that would be. 1 Corinthians 13, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. So you see this turn. We can't just look at a term in scripture and say, children are always good and it's okay for them to stay children. He's saying, yes, children are good, but it's not good for them to remain children. That's Paul's argument right here. We must come to Jesus as a child, trusting and willing to follow, but it is his plan that we not remain childish. That's what he's saying. I gave gifts to my church. I gave gifts to my people so that you would not remain where you started. You would not remain. The language here is very strong. This word no longer translates a Greek word that has to do with never again. You must never again be childish. So it's a strong word. He gave ministry gifts. He gave ministry gifts to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body until we all reach unity of the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This is like a coach standing at practice after we got beat by 30 runs, we didn't score any, and saying, here's where we're going. Here's what we're going to do. Here are the things we need to work on. Here are the things I want you to do. Remember what a good team looks like. Remember where we're going. Remember that this is all about me taking you, this motley group of five and six-year-olds, and saying, we're going to be the group that declares what, it look, what a t-ball team is meant to look like. We're going to be champions by the end of the year. God is saying something so much more important. I have chosen through you, the church, that the man, my manifold wisdom will be made known to your neighbors, to every being, seen and unseen, that's ever been created. It's through my church. That's what I've chosen to do, through the church. And in order to do that, I've given these gifts so that you wouldn't stay unable to be the church. You would grow and you would manifest my glory through all these categories that he's going to talk about through the rest of this book. So in this verse, he's talking about the negative aspects of being children. And I want to look a little bit more deeply at these. These are, so here's some bullet points if you look at this. It's, Paul's describing spiritual children, not the positive side of it, not the faith and coming and trusting, which is all there in the Bible. Those are true. But he's describing the negative aspects of children here. Spiritual children, as Paul vividly here informs us, are tossed to and fro by the waves, 
They're carried about by every wind of doctrine. They're carried about by human cunning. They're carried about by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Those are his four descriptions. So these are the negative aspects of being a child. Don't stay this way. You all started this way. Some of you have grown faster than others, but you all started this way. That's not my intention for you. I don't want you to stay there. So as I studied this passage, I was impressed by the fact that there seemed to be this growth in these thoughts. There seemed to be a a, a, a factor of things changing through this as he walked through that. It seems like it starts with something that's relatively haphazard and unintentional, like the results of living in a sin-sick world, and then it moves towards something that's more intentional. So listen to these things, these words that he uses. Spiritual children are rudderless and anchorless. That's what he's, that's the picture he's giving. Imagine a piece of cork, cork out of a wine bottle, throw it into the middle of the ocean, okay? It is going to be tossed back and forth by the waves. The waves are random at that point. We're not talking about being on the shore. At the shore, the waves all of a sudden are no longer random, are they? They're coming in. But in the middle of the ocean, if you're a piece of cork, and that's actually how all of us were born, we were dropped as a piece of cork in the middle of an ocean, in the middle of a sin-sick world, and we have no anchor, no rudder, no nothing. That's who we were. And like the cork, we were dead, spiritually dead. We're just going to be battered back and forth by these waves. But the waves, is this is an image that Paul is giving us. This cork has no ability within itself to withstand the waves. It's going to be just tossed back and forth as the waves come. Random. It seems random. It seems unintentional at that point. Okay, they don't have any seamanship, they've got no sails, they've got no engine, they've got no ability to get, they don't even know that there is a shore at that particular point in time. Waves in the middle of the ocean, back and forth, it's a picture of the battering that occurs in a world that's been traumatically and overwhelmingly affected by sin and the resultant chaos of that. There are random, apparently, random earthquakes. There are random tornadoes and hurricanes and tsunami and diseases and random acts of violence and wars and rumors of wars. There is apparently random prosperity and good things. So we can come to a place of calm and think this is the way life should be. And in fact, it's not. Okay, we're in the middle of the ocean and we don't know where we're going. It's a world that to childish eyes, we're all starting as children, makes no sense. We're just endlessly up one wave and down the other. And yet we're driven by something within us to interpret, to be interpreters of what's going on around us. So we all start as existentialists. It begins with me. In the beginning was me, and I evaluate the world. That's how we start. We're spiritually dead. Winds, now think about this, in the middle of the ocean, are different than waves. They come from a direction, and they go to a direction. Now, they can come from 360 different points on the compass, east, west, north, south, and everything in between. But the winds are blowing in a certain direction. Paul compares doctrines to these winds. They can come from any direction. They can go in any direction. They have the effect of moving anything in their path in the direction that they're heading. This is like these various doctrines that men devise to make sense of the chaos and the confusion and the pain that's in their world. So we have the battering of the waves, We have winds that come through and seek to push us, push our little cork boat in the direction. Doctrines are the teachings of God and of men. That's what these winds are. Like the winds, some are harmful and destructive. They're formulated from the philosophies of men. They begin as a way of explaining the world, and they often become then a force that radically affects the world. So often in the history of mankind, we start with the philosophers who are just thinking about the way the world works. They're evaluating. They're looking at it. They're formulating ideas. And then those ideas become a hurricane force. They turn into something that drives mankind in a certain direction. You can think, especially those of you old, that are older, can think back through how many things in your lifetime have started as a man's idea and have become truth. They become, this is the way we must go. So doctrines are these teachings of men. Paul is saying here that spiritual children are unable to discern the good sound doctrine, God's good wind, these trade winds that are going to take us safely home, the unity of the faith, this one wind of God that's going to blow us to where we're supposed to be from every other doctrine. Instead, they're carried about by every wind of doctrine. So that's his picture that he's creating. Sometimes, often, they can seem helpful and beneficial. And at first, Paul refers only to every wind of doctrine. He doesn't give it a 
a judgment. He doesn't give it a qualification. He doesn't say that it's either good or bad. And then he moves a little further and he gives us a little bit more. As he moves through his description of these negative aspects of being a child, Paul's language changes and he insinuates now a greater intentionality in the forces that batter our little cork boat. He speaks of human cunning and craftiness and deceitful schemes. And again, Peter O'Brien writes this, behind this dangerous and misleading teaching by which immature believers are tossed to and fro are deceitful people who seek to manipulate them by evil trickery. Paul's language is graphic. The false teaching which causes so much strife is promoted by the cunning of men. Cunning literally refers to dice playing and comes to be used metaphorically of a trickery that results from craftiness, while the qualifier of men depicts it as human and therefore opposed to Christ and his teaching. The language Paul uses indicates a malicious deception by which the false teachers seek to lead the unstable astray. But the apostle may have had in mind another source of that seductive cunning which preys on human weakness, namely the evil one himself. Satan's machinations have method. His aim is to mislead the immature, think of Eve, who are not grounded on apostolic doctrine within the context of verses 7 through 16. The dangers presented here only serve to highlight the importance of the ascended Christ giving ministers of his word to his people. They, the people, are to be firmly grounded in the apostolic teaching so that they may leave behind all mature immaturity and instability. So God, who sees our little cork boat floating in the middle of the ocean, sends help, sends, first he creates a boat, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But then once the boat is created, he peoples that boat with leaders and people that can help to guide the boat home and to bring the immature to maturity. That's the picture that he's painting here. Paul leaves no doubt as to the absolute moral aspect of every wind of doctrine. These winds come from somewhere. These winds go somewhere. The direction of the winds has been planned by someone. And its effect is either fulfilling God's purpose, taking us home to that heavenly shore, or it's proceeding from human cunning and craftiness and deceitful scheming, potentially even demonic, definitely even demonic as we look further. The problem with spiritual children, like, as I said, is that they're unable to discern sound doctrine, God's wind, from the other winds that are blowing. And those winds are coming from every direction. It's imperative. It's imperative. It's imperative that we together grow and change. No spiritual child left behind in his immaturity. The church is to grow and manifest the glorious wisdom of God to a watching world, to a watching universe. They need to see the church and go, oh, I get it. I see. I see God in his church. This is his intention. My intent he says, is that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God, that's going to entail us all growing together and turning these spiritual double plays so that people can see and go, only God could have done this. Only God could have done this. So here's some examples of this. We, we, we're, we are inundated day in, day out, starting from the moment we're born with false doctrines. These winds are hurricane force around us. The older you get, the more things are on the internet, the more things you're hearing, the more books, New York Times bestsellers that are written, it's, we're just inundated. You watch the news, um, false doctrine, every day, every night, all the time. We already talked about Eve. Did God really say? What was he saying there? Are you sailing on the right wind here, Eve? Are you sure you're heading for the right shore? First, it was just a question. Then it was a direct lie. You will not die. God's a liar. You are on the wrong wind. Okay, that's how it starts. That's how every one of these starts. When I went to college, I grew up in the Presbyterian Church. That's why I never sit on the front row, except when I come here, I guess, because there wasn't a row in front of me. I should have sat in the second row, because Presbyterians don't sit in the front row, at least in my experience. And when I went to college, one of the first things I heard going to a campus Bible study from another kid that was going to another church that I'd never even heard of before was, if you're a Presbyterian, you are not a Christian. Okay? Now, that is a wind. Blowing through my life at a time when I was alone, I didn't know anybody, I was four hours from home, and I had never heard anything like that. All I knew from my growing up was that certain 
churches were good and certain churches were bad, and we were the good guys, and everybody else, like the Methodists and the Catholics and all those other people, were pretty much bad, and we could just pray for them and hope for the best for them. But we were the, we were the chosen ones. So I knew that was my doctrine, which was equally false. And his, he had the same doctrine. Basically, my church is it. And if you're a Presbyterian, you're not a Christian. Well, wow, I'm getting battered by a wind. I had no, I was not planning on this. I thought everybody was Presbyterian, unless except the bad guys. So that was, that was my experience there. Fortunately, God had given me, through nothing I had deserved, but I had a, this wonderful aunt who just encouraged me to read the Bible. So throughout high school, I had just read the Bible every night, two chapters, every night, reading out of my mom's old study Bible, which I have no idea. I didn't read the notes. I just read the Bible, two chapters, every night, two chapters. That was my formula. This is how I grow. I, I didn't even know whether I was growing. I was just a little cork boat floating along. And, but I knew as I heard this and as I heard the elders at this church trying to convince me that what they had convinced this fellow student of, that their church was the church, I knew something was wrong. And it was because God had protected me by giving me some vestige of sound doctrine that I was able to say, no, nah, this doesn't sound right. So I went back to my pastor, who was very angry, by the way, when I got home and I told him, if I'm a Presbyterian, I'm not a Christian Answer me that. Riddle me that, Pastor. Uh, tell, me what, tell me what I need to say to this guy. Uh, later, when I was stronger in the faith, I was working at a hospital, and we had a Christian psychiatric unit, so we were dealing with a lot of very seriously depressed people and suicidal people and self-mutilative people. And we had a group of, uh, of people that had been seriously abused. All of them were suicidal. All of them had, had done these self-mutilating behaviors. And we taught in this group, teaching on the the second great commandment, which is love others as you love yourself. So we're on firm biblical ground here. But what we were teaching to this group of ladies who were bent on hurting themselves, they told us that they despised themselves. They hated themselves. All of them seriously abused by people. They had been victimized by many people. They hated themselves. Here's what we taught them. You, you're not going to be able to love others unless you love first. See what it says here? You have to love yourself that becomes the basis of you loving others. Love others as you love yourself. Sounds good. Totally false doctrine. We're teaching false doctrine. I'm a, I've been a Christian for whatever, 20, 15 years by this time. But I needed somebody to come along and say, uh, no, let's explain something a little bit more to you. It's not that they really hate themselves. Really what they're struggling with is their relationship with God who loves them. That's what they need to hear. If you focus them on their own hearts and loving themselves, they're, they're going to be a cork boat in a tossed sea forever. But you need to show them that there's a boat that's going to get to the shore and they can be on it. And they don't have to be this little cork anymore floating around in the sea. We need to point them to the Lord, not to themselves. Here's a very popular teaching. Some of you may have heard this seminar. Here's a statement from it. It's based on Ephesians 5, which we heard read this morning. Preaching, You guys, it was amazing. Uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. It's amazing to watch the Holy Spirit work in a church where I wasn't here. You'd have no, any idea other than the passage what we were going to be talking about. And yet the Spirit moved through the people who spoke this morning, through the worship, through all of these things. E even through, here we come to Ephesians 5. Here's the teaching that's very popular, very popular book. Husbands need respect. Wives need love. That's why God says, wives, see to it that you respect your husbands. And husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. The, the way that we're going to interpret that is that husbands, the reason wives need to love their husbands because, I mean, respect their husbands is because husbands need respect. That is not, that's not in the Bible. Nowhere does it say husbands need respect. Nowhere does it say wives need love. In fact, what it says is husbands love. If there's any need there, it's for husbands to love their wives. It's for wives to respect their husband. But by turning it around and creating a doctrine out of something that was true, we've created a false doctrine. It is simply not true. And it will not help marriages, ultimately, to get to where God wants them to be. It might be temporarily helpful because it, it creates a sense of this is what we need to be doing. And it looks biblical, but it's not ultimately true. This is how difficult it is to deal with false doctrine. What about Peter? Here's Peter's doctrine. When he hears that Jesus is going to go to Jerusalem and die, what does he say? Oh, no, you're not. 
You're not going to go to Jerusalem and die. May it never be, Lord. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to die with you. You're not going to Jerusalem. And so Jesus, that so- it sounds so good, so noble. I'm going to do this. You're not going to go. We're going to protect you. You are this amazing guy that, that's doing all these things. And we get to keep you from going to Jerusalem where there's people that don't understand you as, well, as I do. And they don't love you the way that I do. And, they, and, and, and Jesus turns to him and says, get behind me, Satan. You don't have in mind the wind of God. You're being buffeted and blown about by these doctrines of men. You don't get it. It's false doctrine. How, this is how it comes. What about the movie, God is Not Dead? How many of you have seen that? You've not seen it? Some of you have seen it? So many ways, that's a great movie. There's so many things in that movie that are really good. There's, there's false doctrine in that movie. Because that he brings this really excellent ex, uh, apologetic conclusion to an end. He goes, the, the conclusion to the matter is this. It's free will. God gave decisions over to us. That's why God has to allow things to happen in his universe. Basically, what he's saying at the end of that movie is God gives control for who's in the boat over to people that are floating around his corks. Okay? So it's a great movie, but we just need to help our children if we're watching through this. Now, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the fact that that is, it's so close, but not quite. What about the, the major doctrine that's out there right now? Love wins. There's no hell. It's a major doctrine floating around in the the blogosphere and all of these things. God will not. It's basically the the doctrine of universalism. Everybody's going to be saved. We don't really say that out loud, but if there's no hell, then there's no judgment, then God is a liar. We can go right back to the garden with Eve and agree with Eve and agree with the serpent. These are critical things. There's one wind. There's one faith that's going to take us. And we've got, none of us have it. That's why we have to grow up from children up to mature men. Here's another one, and I, I'm going to read a, uh, something from R.C. Sproul here in just a second, but there, there's a back and forth on this. Salvation is by faith. Sanctification, sanctification requires effort. True or false? Okay? Salvation, justification, coming to the Lord is by faith. Sanctification requires effort. Now, we're getting into nitpicky stuff here. That's a true statement. Absolutely true. The problem with it is it's got a flavor. It, it could be misinterpreted as saying, God saved me. Now it's up to me. He created kind of a dichotomy in that statement. Instead of saying, work out your salvation with fear and trembling because God's at work within you. So sanctification, sanctification does require our work and our effort, but not apart from God. So anything that would indicate that we get saved by something God did, and then the rest of it's up to us, becomes false doctrine. Or here's another one. Growth is automatic. Everybody who God saves will get to the final shore. That's true, but it leaves a lot of the Bible out when we say that. Basically, it's let go and let God. That's not true. Let go and let God is not in the Bible. It sounds really good. It sounds like I'm depending on God. It's just not dependent on the word and the wind of God, which is blowing us to that shore. Pelagius, in response to what Augustine said, here's what Augustine or Augustine Augustine said, grant what thou commandest. Here's a prayer. Lord, grant what thou commandest and command what thou desire. In other words, what he's saying is, command us whatever you want, but then give us what we need to be able to obey that command. That was his prayer. And um, Pelagius came to Rome during that period after Augustine had said this. He came to Rome. He sees the church in Rome, and he sees moral laxity there. So here's what what, um, R.C. Sproul writes. The provocation of this prayer by Augustine stimulated a British monk by the name of Pelagius to react strenuously against its contents. He didn't like the prayer. When Pelagius came to Rome sometime in the first decade of the 5th century, he was appalled by the moral laxity he observed among professing Christians and even among the clergy. So basically, he's looking at this ship and going, this, there's immature people on this ship. His observation was correct. But what he did with that was create false doctrine called Pelagianism, which basically said man is not created evil, but man in himself has the ability to respond to God in in and of himself apart from the grace of God. So he started with an observation the church should not look like this. He was right. He ended 
with false teaching that was condemned for the next multiple hundreds of years as a heresy. So did he have good intent? Maybe, we don't really know. But the enemy did not have good intent in working through that. So Pelagianism is one of many, many, many named heresies that the church has condemned over the years. We need to be very, very careful with heresy. I've got a list here that I'm not going to read out, but you know, literally hundreds of named heresies that the church named over the first thousand years of church history, all of these things coming, typically coming from leaders in the church. These leaders that God has given, but as Paul said, there were going to be false leaders as well, leading people astray. Justin Holcomb, in a book about heresies, wrote this, orthodoxy, this is the wind of God, right orthodox, we want to be orthodox, we want to have sound doctrine, going, letting God blow us where he has for us to go. Orthodoxy is the teaching that best follows the Bible and best summarizes what it teaches, best accounts for the paradoxes and apparent contradictions, best preserves the mystery of God in the places where reason cannot go, and best communicates the story of the forgiveness of the gospel. I love that quote. I mean, it's just got a little bit of everything in there. So I, that, but that, those are the, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the breath, the wind of God to blow. So I read, studied this passage, one of the things that we always want to look for because of Jesus saying these, these words that you're reading, which are life, they all bear witness to me. Where is Jesus in this passage? We see that he's the one, he's the coach of all coaches who knows the end from the beginning. He knows the people that are in the boat. He knows the ones that are floating outside the boat. He's able to bring people into this ark that he's created that's heading, this gospel ark that's heading for the shore. But where is, where is he in this sentence? I was just praying about that. And I, just, I felt like the Lord just prompted me with this. That the scripture tells us that Jesus came as a child. He started as a child just as every one of us does. Okay. He had to grow, the scripture says, in wisdom and knowledge and favor with God and man. Jesus grew. He didn't just start life as a mature God in the flesh being. He started as, a mature, as an immature God in the flesh child, sinless but immature. He had to learn. Here's a, an amazing verse. He had to learn obedience through the things that he suffered. He was willing to come, to empty himself, to be tempted to live a perfect life, never deviating from the wind of God. Never. His little, he was not a cork boat, but his little boat never deviated. It's one that created this ark for us. He had emptied himself, becoming nothing. So just as we had to start as children, he chose to start as an infant as well. As a result of this, now listen, he was exalted to the highest place. He became the head of the church. He became the builder, the builder of the eternal ark that is going to bring us all to that shore. And he decided to give gifts to men, gifts in the form of apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers or pastor teachers so that we would no longer be childish, so that we would all grow up. No child can remain a child. And no local church can or should remain immature, unable to contend for the faith and be a pillar and foundation of the truth. As we were worshiping this morning, and Rob, thank you. I mean, such a wonderful job. I mean, I listened to last week's message, just the way that you responded to it. I mean, you guys are blessed in this church. Uh, What Rob has to do every week is a tough job because he wants to help all of us come to uh, enjoy and declare, but also remember. So we're, there, you know, you're singing these songs and this, this, these songs, I felt like, okay, this message is being preached as I'm listening to these songs, as I'm engaging in these songs. So that just a mark of the Lord's, the spirit is there. You've been given a gift in that man. Then we have these words that come, okay, from Colossians 1. What, what did you just hear Mark Wally say, impressed by the Spirit of God this morning, he's pointing to this one who is the fullness of God. So basically, he's the one that's been given. He is the fullness of God. He's pointing to Jesus, exactly what we want to do here. And then we heard the word to, to those of you that are struggling with not being able to have children. There's false winds that attack you when you're in those kinds of places. And you heard the true wind of God, God alone. And then I already talked about 
the, the prayer, prayer for marriages. That's like one of the ways that we grow up into him who is the, the head. So people are going to see through our marriages what it means. Oh, that's what it looks like when Jesus loves the church. And that's what it looks like when the church responds. That marriage has led me to the boat. Okay? All for the glory of God. As we saw, it's not bad to start as a child. We have to come to Jesus. There may be some of you in this room who are still little boats floating around that you don't know this one. And there's only one way to come to him. There's only one way. We sang it this morning. The, the only way is to come to the one who perfectly fulfilled this and who died to make you a place on the boat, on this ark. And if you're there, there's only two things you can listen to, either the voice of God or everything else. And the voice of God would say to you, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I am the way and the truth and the life. I have the one faith, the one doctrine of God. If you're in that category this morning, we, people would love to pray for you. They'd love to help you get on the boat. You don't do anything to get on the boat except take the hand of the one who says, I died for you. I'm here. I created this boat and it can take you safely home. For the rest of you who are on this boat, we need to be growing. We need to be changing. We need to be working ahead and, and becoming the spiritual team that can turn a double play as a five and six year old T-ball team. Application. A couple things. First one is this. Remember that this is about us so that we will no longer be infants. The church of God has to assure that no one's growth or maturity is stunted. All of us need to make sure that no one's growth or maturity is stunted. Take care, however, just as a one warning, not to use this as a license to become someone that you're not. You are not the father or mother of someone else's children. So don't take that responsibility on yourself. Someone else has that role. You're not an overseer in this church until you're appointed to be an overseer in this church. So be careful not to act, not to act in a manner that is not in keeping with what you've been called to do. Use your gifts. Don't try to use other people's gifts as you're going through this. It's, it, the church has a biblical shape. There's order on the ship. God gave gifts to every one of you, and then he's given specific gifts to his church so that on, life on the ship is getting increasingly godlike. Increasingly, we're heading more directly. We're not being buffeted and battered together by this. Secondly, then, as an application, all of us have various waves and winds of doctrine floating through our lives. All of us. If you, if you think you've got it all straight, I, I guarantee you there's things in your life that are coming from another source. And you may have accepted, just as I did. I'm, I mean, I've been a, a Christian for many years, and I'm teaching those ladies in the hospital, you've got to love yourself before you're going to be able to love others. It's false doctrine. I needed a big brother to come along and say, no, brother, that's not right. Don't do, don't say that. Let's talk, let's go back to scripture again, help you, you know, all through our lives to the end of our lives. We all need one another. We need the help of helping us to take our eyes off of what we believe and going back. So if your doctrines come from books that say uh, men need to be respected, uh, women need to be loved or anything like that, take that back to scripture, take that back to your leaders. Ask, is this true? Is this going to get us to the shore where we're going? Is this what God has for us? God's given you his word and he's given you these men to help you. When I, um, just a couple of quick things, just as a pastor, we had a, a guy in one of our churches one time that he uh, believed that the King James was the only Bible. And he brought me all of these things and he had really studied this. And so I, I'm like, I've never heard some of these arguments before. And I didn't quite know how to respond to some of the things that he was saying about some historical figures. So I was able to call Jeff Percival and say, Jeff, how do you respond to this? You know, I don't, I don't know how to respond to this guy to help him with this particular thing. And so Jeff was able to help me. All of us, your pastors, all of us need those kinds of things. We're going to hit a wave, a wind that we've not heard before. And it could potentially cause the boat to tip. There's help. There's the one who built the boat, first of all, and then there's the others that he's given to help to steer the boat home. Uh, yeah, we're we're going to wrap up here in just a second. Many of you have probably heard the counterfeit bill analogy. This is this is where how do you, how do you train FBI agents to determine whether a hundred dollar bill is is real or counterfeit? Well, if you've never heard this story, the answer is you have them study the real, 
And if you ever, if you want to read a great story, go on to Tim Challey's blog and read about his experience with the Bank of Canada, finding out whether this is really true or if it's just a myth. There's a great story there. But the point of that, the whole story is don't study false doctrine in order to figure out what false doctrine is. Study what's true. Study the word. Study the word together. Study the word with your pastors. Come on Sunday. Don't neglect to listen to the message, even if you weren't there. Go back and listen to it on, on tape and, and be, be those people who are pursuing the word with all your heart and want to get the whole ship to the shore. We're going to wrap up, and I, what I'd like to do is pray for your pastors, if we could. So I'm going to take uh, the liberty to do that. These are guys that have been given to you. I want to commend them as an application point. I just want to commend them to you. I've known John for a lot of years. I actually saw him be born. And I have i didn't see Aaron be born, but I have known Aaron for 11 years now. These are two really godly men. They love the Lord. They love you. I hear it when I talk to them about you. I hear their passion for every one of you, not a single one of you to be left behind. They, they have that passion. They have that passion for the word. And yet if in the first thousand years of church history, there were hundreds of fallacious teachings, heresies, wrong winds that were brought to the church by leaders of the church, these guys need your prayers. They need your prayers to stay in the word. They need the, your prayers to live the word before you, to be examples to the flock. They, they need the grace of God to keep them on course so that they can help to keep your ship on course as you're moving forward and maturing as a church. So I, I'd love to pray for them. If we could do that right now, let's just, why don't we just have them sit right in the middle. You guys can all just hold your hands out and kind of symbolically say, Lord, let's pray for these pastors. These are the ones you've given us to assure that we are not remaining children. He gave these men to you as a local church as a small ship within the bigger ship to assure that you not remain children. So, Father, I do pray for these guys. I thank you for their passion for you, which you've given them. I thank you that they have nothing that you've not given them. As a matter of fact, and I ask you, Lord, to keep them humble before you, keep them knowing regularly that it's in their weakness that your strength will be manifested. I pray, Father, that you would just give them increasingly visions of you, that they would be these great under coaches, coaching this team, seeing ahead what you have in store for this particular local church, this part of your greater body. Lord, I ask you to give them wisdom. I ask you to give them deep love for these people, for these sheep, the same love that you have, Lord. I pray that you, they would fulfill the the commands, the exhortations that Peter brings to fellow elders, that they would love this church, that they would not in any way abuse or use this church, that they would willingly want to serve this church. Father, please watch over them. Please protect them, protect their wives, their marriages, their families. Lord, protect this church and lead this church safely home. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.